Hey what's going on Rollplays, it's the Bard here and welcome back to the corner. So it's Subscriber Sunday and our highest upvoted comment is Maybe do a video on game mechanics like skills when you use perception versus investigation, how stealth works, just things new gamers don't always get right. In many cases it's the DM who needs to know how the skills work because they will be the ones asking for all the skill checks. But it is useful for the players to know a few certain little things. So what we'll go over today is what the players need to know and what the DMs need to know and how to improve the use of skills and how to speed up your game in doing so. So the first thing that I think trips up some players is things like grapple because grapple is related to your skills. Grapple is a strength based ability check based on athletics. This check is contended by strength athletics or dexterity acrobatics. I think what really confuses players is the fact that it's done as an attack action, so even though you're using an action as part of an attack, it still counts as an ability check, and that's the thing you have to use. So you would roll, you would add your strength modifier, and then you would add your proficiency modifier with your athletics. Once the check succeeds, the grapple target is remaining in this grapple from round to round, and it won't be able to move away unless it takes certain actions in order to release itself from the grapple. Shove works in exactly the same way as grapple does. You take the attack action, but you replace one of your attacks with the maneuver that you want to use, and then you use your athletics in order to make the roll, and then you contend it with, again, either athletics or acrobatics. Something that doesn't always happen, but can happen sometimes, is if you are making a skill check as part of an action or part of a special ability that your class has, but you're using it in the wrong method. A good example of this would be the Inquisitive from Xanathar's Guide to Everything, where you can use a bonus action to make a wisdom perception check to spot hidden creatures or objects, or an intelligence investigation check to uncover or decipher clues. The ability only works for specific aspects of this skill, so make sure you check it before you try to start using it. The absolute biggest thing I think people make a mistake in doing isn't necessarily a mechanical one, but it's just basically a role-playing one. And it's basically not trying. If you don't have a proficiency in something, in many cases it still means you can attempt to have a go at it, you just won't get a couple of extra bonuses added on. If there's something specific that you want to do in the game, and the DM says, okay, you need to make this particular kind of roll, you just say, well, I have this skill or I don't have this skill, can I make the roll? They'll tell you yes or no, and then just go with it. Just, just keep asking questions and keep asking if you can have a chance to do the thing that you want to do. You don't always need proficiency in something in order to be able to do that thing. The one exception to this is the help action. If you want to help someone do something else in order to give them advantage, you need to have that skill proficiency in order to do so. A perfectly reasonable example of this would be the medicine roll. If you were trying to stabilize a dying creature, it wouldn't be enough to just have someone handing you bandages and expect that to get you an advantage. But a person with the medicine skill would know where to apply pressure to stop the bleeding, would know how to apply bandages properly. Put simply, another person's help is only beneficial when they know what they're doing too. So we've gone over some of the ways in which players tend to use skills incorrectly, and to be honest, there aren't very many because there's not much that you can get wrong. I think the more likely scenario is that DMs will get skills wrong in their application or their general function. So for this next bit, I'd like to go over how DMs use skills, or more accurately, perhaps how they should be using the skills. So first of all, you want to consider the appropriate use of the skill. You don't want to just put in one skill and interchange it with another. We'll use the example from the comment from earlier, which is perception versus investigation. So both skills in their description suggest that when you're actively looking for something, you would use one or the other. But in order to have a relevance to each skill, there would need to be some distinction. So perception is based on the fact that you don't know that something is there, not that something is necessarily hidden from you. You would use a perception role in order to find something, but it's based on the fact that you don't know that there's a problem already. This is in opposition to something like investigation, where you are aware of something and then try to pick up additional information based on it. So I'll give you an example. The player characters walk into a room. They see nothing apart from a few crates, a door leading to the next area, and a table and some chairs. The DM asks for a perception roll. Some of them make it, some of them don't. But the ones that make it, they see a box. And from that box, they happen to notice a red liquid coming out of it. The players didn't know that that was there in the first place until someone made their perception roll. So it's as simple as that. 
perception in order to see something that you're not aware of. So let's move the story along now a little bit. They open up the box and inside they find some clothes and these clothes are stained with this red liquid. The clothes are stained and somewhat torn. Now it wouldn't take a genius to work out what had happened, but maybe the players want to figure out exactly who these clothes belong to. So the DM might then ask for an investigation roll. Should the players pass said investigation roll, they might find something like an official document with an official seal, or perhaps a signature on it, which might give some indication as to who the owner of these clothes were, and possibly what happened to them. Now I've seen a lot of games where someone will say, okay, I want to convince this guard of X, Y, Z, you know, whatever is true. And then the DM says, okay, give me a persuasion roll. And the player turns around and says, well, I've got deception. Another example would be if you were walking down an alleyway and some bandits jumped out on you and they wanted to take all of your gold and you say to them, if you don't let me pass, I'll turn you on to frogs. The DM might say, oh, okay, make an intimidation roll. And your player character then comes back and says, oh, well, I've got deception. Because these all sort of fall within the same sphere, things like persuasion, deception, intimidation, it's very easy for a player character to say, oh, well, I've got this particular aspect of a skill and therefore can I use that instead because I'm kind of lying or I'm kind of telling the truth or I'm kind of being intimidating. In this situation, I think the answer should always be no. Now, we'll use the last example. You said to these bandits, I'm going to turn you into frogs. You have tried to intimidate them. Just because you're a rogue and not a wizard doesn't mean that you can then use deception for this check. You have tried to intimidate them, therefore you need to make an intimidation check. Just because what you're saying isn't necessarily true, it is a deception, but you have used it in an intimidating manner. So you are making intimidation, but it's a lie, but at the same time you're still being intimidating, so I should be able to use deception. No, you've made an intimidation, therefore make an intimidation check. It might seem a bit authoritarian to tell the players they can't use a particular skill in a particular fashion, but the thing is you're trying to be the rules arbiter here. You are trying to be fair. And if someone is doing something specific and trying to pass it off as something else, it's not helping. You're not doing them any favours by allowing them to cut corners in this way. So what you're going to want to do is make sure that they use their skills correctly. You're not challenging yourself by making one declaration and using a skill that isn't appropriate in order to back it up. What we often do when we talk is we tend to just talk in reaction to the things that we hear. We don't stop and think about it, we just go with what feels natural at the time. And if that's the case, if there is a social situation in a role playing game and you come back with an instant response and that response would be linked to a specific skill check, then the DM should be making you use that particular skill. Or if you don't have that skill, then the DM should be making you make an ability check without that particular proficiency modifier. So I want to talk about speeding up your games as well in relation to skills. So not everything needs to be a contest. What's going to happen most of the time when you have something like stealth versus perception? It's going to be a case of, okay, party A makes their stealth checks against party B, which makes their perception checks. The DM wants to be making full use of the passive checks section that's in the player's handbook. The DM could be setting his creature's perception abilities at a particular level in order to give the player something to roll against. Now, this doesn't necessarily work in every situation, but it might be something that's definitely worth considering for routine things, such as sneaking past sleeping guards. The DM would set the value at 10 plus all the relevant skill modifiers, with a plus or minus 5 depending on advantage or disadvantage. By doing this, it's just a DC that the players have to roll against, rather than having to compare everything all the time. It also adds a level of reward to a degree, so if you're setting your creature's awareness to a particular number based on the passive checks ability, and the players do some really innovative stuff in order not to get caught, then this will allow them to get past without the unfortunate intervention of fate. I've seen too many games where the players take every single precaution under the sun in order not to get caught, and somehow through some impossible stroke of luck, the sleeping guard that was turned away from them with their back to the door somehow knows you're there. It's definitely a good tool and it should definitely be used a lot more, especially for speeding up games, because if you've got the number in your head, you just tell the people to roll against it, and then you don't have to calculate your own numbers or take time rolling your own dice. So the DM can just instantly assess whether or not something succeeds or fails, and move the story on from there. Group checks should be used as much as is reasonably possible. So group survival checks, group investigation checks if they're all working on the same thing, even group stealth checks can be a thing. Anything that the whole party is doing at the same time should definitely be given the consideration for a group check. Sometimes you just want to do things very, very quickly, and group checks is a great way of doing this. 
if one person fails something like a survival check and falls foul to an environmental hazard, then that takes a lot of time out of the game in order to fix that problem. Group checks just mean that you are more likely to succeed more often in certain aspects, especially when you consider the fact that most of the time you'd be trying to help each other get through that situation anyway. DMs should be quite clear when they're classifying something as a group check, that way the players don't have to worry quite so much about their individual roles, just all they really need to concern themselves is, do they all succeed on average? There's just one other thing that I want to touch on in relation to skills, and it's when effects happen for skills. Now this isn't a mistake necessarily that people make, but it is just something that's worth noting. If for example a player character attempts a sleight of hand to lift something off another person, then it might be worth just letting them take the object. If they fail their sleight of hand roll as opposed to someone's perception roll, then you don't necessarily have to explain the fact that you've seen them do it. Perhaps the person being stolen from didn't notice, but maybe there was another witness or something who noticed what was going on. And rather than just walk up to someone who's holding a great big dagger or greatsword or something, perhaps they just go and get the guards because that's probably what someone would do in that situation. Say for example a player makes a deception check and it goes wrong. Now something might not happen immediately, but three or four sessions down the line when you're coming into a new town and you're expecting a warm welcome, perhaps you get arrested by the guards. The person who a player character has tried to deceive has sent word ahead to the next town saying that people matching your description are coming into town and that they cannot be trusted. Simply put, if there's no immediate danger from failure, then it doesn't necessarily have to be an immediate effect. So that's everything that I wanted to cover today in relation to skills. Now there are a number of things that can go wrong in a game of D&D, or any other role playing game for that matter. If you want more video on game mechanics, if you want more videos on builds, if you want more videos on analysis, if you want more videos on character behaviour, no matter what it is you want, put it in the comments down below and get ready for the next Subscriber Sunday. Highest upvoted comment will be the focus of Subscriber Sunday. Be sure to like, comment and subscribe. Make sure you get notified, share the content around, tell all your friends to subscribe to the Bard, and I will catch you guys next time at the gaming table. <laughs>